Handling Hazardous Building Materials, How to Avoid a Construction Nightmare. We're glad you could join us. My name's James. I run webinars and events here at Triumvirate, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief overview on what the webinar is going to entail as we run through a few housekeeping items. So for those who are new to our webinars, you'll note that uh, your line is muted. Uh, that will be the case for the entirety of the webinar. But if you do have a question for our speakers or a technical issue comes up, you can use the questions pane over on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate. Following the presentation today, there will be an open question and answer period. You can ask questions anytime throughout the webinar. We'll just get to them afterwards, and we should have uh, five or ten minutes to get to those. And finally, you will receive a copy of today's presentation as well as the webinar recording in an email tomorrow. So all of the materials presented today will be in your inbox tomorrow. Um, and I want to in introduce our speakers at this time. Today we have Ryan Miller and Maria Reisha Vesotska. I'm going to start with Ryan, who is an engineering project manager at Triumvirate Environmental, where he's conducted numerous environmental engineering projects and remedial response actions. This includes hazardous building materials identification, all in accordance with federal, state, and local environmental regulations. Mr. Miller has carried out engineering consulting services, remedial system operation and maintenance, building material inspections, and emergency response work. He has a BS in environmental engineering from the University of New Hampshire. Maria is also an environmental engineer at Triumvirate, where she conducts multiple environmental remedial response actions and consulting services. The projects that she works on include contaminated soil and groundwater remediation, underwater storage underground storage tank removals, and building material inspections. Maria has a BS in biology from Cornell University and a master's in environmental science from Southern Illinois University. And so with that, we will start with Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm going to start out uh, just by saying that today's webinar is just kind of an overview of um, these topics. Um, in no way does it really represent a formal training uh, on how to proceed with identifying or sampling these materials. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll get started with asbestos. Um, after that, you'll see we'll get into lead, PCBs, mercury, and then a summary. So let's start out with a poll question. Um, what is your greatest challenge when it comes to asbestos? I'll give everybody a second. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, that poll question should have just displayed on everybody's screens. You'll see the options there um, from identification to sampling, abatement, and creating a management plan, or you can select other. Great. I see the results coming in. We'll just give it a few more seconds so everybody has a chance to respond. <clears throat> Looks pretty close. All right, so let's uh, share those results. Everybody should see that. So Ryan, we've got 34% selected identification. Next was abatement at 28%, and creating a management plan came in third at 17%. All right, that's, that's great, because we're going to touch on all those topics today. Um, let's just start out with a quick overview of asbestos. Um, what is it? was considered the miracle fiber and was used for many reasons, um, particularly resistance to heat, electricity, and chemicals. Um, it's mostly used um, for sound absorbent or the fact that it has high tensile strength and can be woven into cloth. Um, most of the use of asbestos-containing products was banned by the EPA in 1989. However, that rule was vacated and reprimanded by the fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1991, and as a result of that, um, some of the ban was overturned, allowing the materials to still be used. Some types of asbestos are shown here, um, serpentine or chrysotile. It's quickly cleared from the lungs. You can see a picture of it to the right. Um, it's got distinct morphology, and the fibers are often clumped in air. Um, the EPA estimates that 95% of the asbestos in U.S. buildings is chrysotile. And next to that, um, you have, have amosite or amphibole asbestos. Um, you can see the fibers there are 
look a little bit more hazardous just from all the, uh, the sharp points. Um, that type of asbestos, uh, once it enters the lungs, it has the ability to bioaccumulate and be bio-persistent. And that's where a lot of the um, health effects in the lungs comes from. The, this type of asbestos was essentially banned in Western countries in the 1980s just because of that hazard. Suspect materials, um, you can see here some photographs. Pipe insulation is a big one. Floor tile and mastic. Ceiling tile, duct seam glue, joint compound, roofing material, fireproofing, fume hood panels shown. They all have the potential to contain asbestos. So if these building products are in your building, uh, which essentially all of them probably are, um, they can be suspect. So if something is suspect, how do you identify it? Uh, laboratory analysis is really the only way. You can assume something's asbestos if you don't test it, but you cannot identify asbestos by the naked eye. If you look at this picture, uh, it looks like it would be asbestos, but something like this is difficult because you have a thin layer of asbestos directly on the pipe with a thick layer of mineral fiber or cellulose insulation on top of that. So if you have a pipe that's fully covered and you didn't have a break, you wouldn't really be able to identify it. And even sampling for this can be tricky as an inspector because that material is hard to core through. It's very packed tight. So you have to be very diligent when it comes to sampling and locating asbestos on things like piping. That's why uh, regulatory agencies require a licensed asbestos inspector find it, and they have a specific sampling methodology that you're supposed to follow, and it has to be sampled in an accredited laboratory. So asbestos sampling, um, it's described by OSHA and the EPA. Um, it's a very prescriptive method for sampling just to ensure that it can be found within each area. Um, the US EPA Pink Book summarizes the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, or HERA, with sampling guidelines that are very strict in how this stuff has to be, has to be sought out. So it must be performed by a licensed asbestos, asbestos inspector and within accredited laboratory. Um, and there's also NESHAP inspections, which is the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. And they state that any demolition or renovation operation at an institutional or commercial or industrial building is regulated by asbestos NESHAP. And they say at a minimum, a thorough inspection requirement applies. Now that's very vague, but if you can lean on the EPA pink book or the OSHA standards for sampling, then you really know what you're getting into during a renovation or demolition. So in summary, Surface material, surfacing material, is material that is sprayed, troweled on, or otherwise applied to surfaces. Um, that can include acoustical plaster, uh, fireproofing, or anything like that. OSHA does not classify skim coat or taping mud or stucco leveling compound or hard, hard wall plasters as surfacing material. Uh, it's a little confusing since that stuff can be troweled on, but they don't actually consider it. It's actually a miscellaneous material. So when you have sprayed on fireproofing, say, and you have an area that is less than 1,000 square feet, OSHA and EPA say the minimum number of samples to collect is three. And they go by what I like to think of as a 357 rule. If you're between 1,000 and 5,000 square feet, the number of samples increases to five. And if you're greater than 5,000 square feet, the minimum number of samples is seven. Now, the, the pink book actually has a method for taking materials um, in a miscellaneous manner. I'm not going to get into that. It's pretty in-depth. Um, but they, they do have uh, literature describing how to take those samples in a random manner. Thermal system insulation, or TSI, um, that's a big one when it comes to identifying asbestos. Uh, most people are aware of it. You know. It, TSI is applied to pipes, fittings, boilers, breaching, tanks, ducts, and structural components to 
to prevent heat loss or gain. And the method for sampling that, PSI in general, this says a minimum number of three samples. Any patch that's less than six linear feet or square feet has to be sampled. That's any patch in the system, so it could take a pretty thorough inspection to find all those patches. And then elbows and fittings um, or cementitious material, sufficient to determine. And I kind of like to lean on the uh, TSI in general that you should be taking at least three elbows and fittings um, if, they're, if they're involved with that system. But sufficient to determine could mean a significant amount more than three also. So just with those two types of material, it's easy to see how a lot of samples have to be collected to kind of try to, to make sure everything is found. Um, the last materials are miscellaneous materials. Um, that includes all other asbestos-containing materials, floor tiles, mastic, leveling compound, caulking, ductine glue, glue dots. That, those all fall into this. And the EPA says one thing and OSHA says another. So the EPA says at least one sample be collected from each suspected miscellaneous material, where OSHA says sample in a manner sufficient to de determine whether material is ACM or not ACM. Collect bulk samples from each homogeneous area of fri friable miscellaneous material that is not assumed to be ACM. So I take that as um, at least two because it's plural. So EPA says at least one, where OSHA says samples, um, but it's still it's still saying collect enough of this miscellaneous material to really be confident that you've um, exhausted uh, potential for there being asbestos. Definitions. So we've taken our samples, run them to the lab. They give us percentages of asbestos fibers in that material. So the U US EPA defines ACM as anything greater than 1% asbestos. Now. Different state requirements might say something else. For example, I do a lot of work in Massachusetts, and they recently came out with a requirement stating that asbestos-containing waste material for vermiculite containing 1% asbestos or less has to follow what's called a non-routine asbestos abatement work form. And that essentially says you can do it as an abatement with a 10-day notification to the state. You can follow all those work procedures, or you can have a licensed project designer write a plan to get this asbestos vermiculite out by following the similar methods that a 10-day would. So it's essentially an abatement that's not an abatement. It's a non-routine asbestos abatement work. Um, so different states might have different things. Check with your local authorities on everything. So if it's identified, and we know we have to do something about it, there's options. Some things have to be abated if you're doing a demolition or renovation. Or if you want, you can go and have a management plan if you just want to know where asbestos is in your facility. So an abatement must be performed by a licensed contractor and requires a 10 working day notification to the state. Emergency abatements are available and may be performed, but only if they get approval for emergency situations, like a broken pipe or an accidental, accidental release. So once the abatement occurs by that licensed contractor, they have a third party come in and do clearance sampling. And clearing that area, they take down their containment if it's up, and they open it up for reoccupancy. If that's not the route and you just want to know where asbestos is in your facility, you want to create an asbestos management plan or an O&M plan, Operation and Maintenance Program. These management plans should be authored by a licensed management planner, and that's required in some states. An Operations and Maintenance Program is a formulated plan of training, cleaning, work practices, and surveillance performed by an individual who has 16-hour O&M training. Uh, to maintain asbestos-containing materials in good conditions within the building. The goal of that is to minimize the exposure of all building occupants to asbestos fibers. Essentially, that says every year that trained person should go and, and find what that license inspector has seen, um, make sure that the condition that it was noted in previously, see if those conditions have altered. 
If they have, it should be written on the form or abated if it's gotten to that point. And it also says that every three years you should have that license inspector come back and perform another thorough inspection of the areas that they've already done. Um, that is actually required for AHERA plans in K-12 schools. So a case study for uh, Triumvirate. Um, you know, we've, we've done all sorts of inspections, I've worked with subcontractors to do abatements. Um, one of the big things we've done in-house is a facility-wide asbestos inspection and management plan for uh, a, a building, or 12 buildings, sorry, for um, a management plan and pre-demolition. Over 300 samples were collected. Um, asbestos was identified in roofing materials, TSI, mastic floor tiles, fume hood panels, and that those findings were used for pre-demolition of one of the buildings um, to get the permit and to do the demo and the bid. And the rest of that information was used to have a continuous management plan for inspection of the areas, um, had asbestos awareness training for employees so they know where it is and best management practices for them so they don't get exposed. Um, and it continues to be managed through that plan. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maria, and she's going to talk about lead. Hi, everyone. So as Ryan mentioned, I'm going to talk about lead. And we're going to focus on lead in uh, plumbing as well as in lead paint. So lead pipes have been used for centuries, and they were used and they were more attractive than um, iron ones because they were cheaper. They were stable and easily malleable. And as early as uh, the late 1800s, uh, there were recognized health uh, problems due to drinking water from lead pipes. And by early 1900s, more than 70 cities with populations over 30,000 people were using lead plumbing. And it wasn't until 1986 that the Safe Drinking Water Act was enacted which prohibited the use of pipe, solder, or flux in public water systems that was not lead free. So prior to 1986, lead was used in plumbing. Lead paint, on the other hand, was not used as long, for as long as lead in plumbing, but it was used because it was durable and washable. So it was a very attractive product for consumers. And the first ban was a city ban from Baltimore in 1951, where they banned the use of lead paint in uh, residential homes. And in 1978, the federal government banned the consumption use of lead contaminated paint, uh, con sorry, lead containing paint in the United States. And as you can see, according to the EPA, 87% of homes built prior to 1940 may contain uh, lead-based paint. 69% of homes built between 1940 and 1956 contain lead-based paint. And 24% of homes built pro between 1960 and 1977 contain lead-based paint. So the older the uh, facility or the home is, the more likely it will contain lead-based paint. So how does lead get into the plumbing and uh, how are individuals exposed to it? So lead in plumbing and in water is, it enters the water after it leaves the treatment uh, plant. So it's a unique uh, contaminant that it doesn't leave the treatment plant. Contam water doesn't leave the contaminated already. It enters the pipe throughout the system or in your facilities. And lead enters drinking water when pipes that contain lead corrode. So in areas where the water has high acidity or low mineral content. Another location where lead can enter the water is where brass or chrome-plated brass faucets or fixtures with lead solder are present. And the use of hot water causes an increase of lead seeping into the water system. So there are many factors that are involved in the extent of which lead enters the water, and they include 
the chemistry of the water at your facility, the amount of lead that the water comes into contact with, the temperature of the water, the amount of wear in the pipe, how long the water stays in the pipe, and that whether the pipes are coated with any protective coating inside. According to the American Water Works Association, um, it's a nationwide issue. However, it is most likely to be present in the Midwestern and Northeastern region of the United States. And based on this figure, you can see that the main pipe bringing water into a facility is might not be contaminated, might not have lead because it was replaced. However, inside the facility, there can be lead solder, faucet fixtures with lead, and those lead can enter the water through those areas. For lead paint, the, obviously the exposure is any painted surface. So wall ceilings, windows, windowsills, any woodwork or stairs, porches that might be at a building and they're painted, if they're uh, painted prior to 1978, will have the potential for lead paint. And any, they can enter your system through ingestion, and that is a, one of the main ways for children to get lead into their system because they can eat lead, chip, uh, lead paint chips. And inhalation, and that is when lead dust can be formed when lead paint is scraped, sanded, or heated or when ch chipping paint is touched or broken and the dust enters the air. And in areas where settled lead dust is on the floor, it can re-enter the air when the building is cleaned or when people are walking. And this slide just focuses a little on the health effects of lead and Children are more susceptible to lead poisoning because they absorb four to five times as much ingested lead as adults do. And lead is distributed to organs mainly, so brain, kidneys, liver, and bones. Um, and symptoms of lead poisoning are sometimes difficult to identify because they can be confused with symptoms of other illnesses. The Lead Poison Prevention Act passed in 1971, and a lead level of 60 micrograms per deciliter was considered safe. By 2012, the CDC changed that level to 5 micrograms per deciliter. So the important thing is to identify whether there is lead in the drinking water. And you can't just look at water to see whether there is lead. And so you need to sample and send a, a sample to an accredited lab to be analyzed. And it is important to know where to sample. Since the water coming into your system is usually free of lead, it is important to collect those samples at the end of the pipe. So anywhere where water is used for consumption. So it could be a tap or dr a drinking fountain. And sometimes it's important to prioritize sampling sites based on potential use. So high priority sites are areas such as drinking fountains, kitchen sinks, in schools it would be teacher lounges or nurses offices. Medium priority would be bathroom faucets and low priority would be anything like a utility sink or a hose attachment that is less likely to be used for consumption. And based on the system that the water is the population that it uh, supplies is the number of samples that it needs to be collected. So if your facility is less than 100 people and that's where the water system contains less than 100 people, you need at least five sample locations. If you don't have five faucets or drinking locations, there is ways to accomplish that requirement by coming back at a later date and re sampling those areas to get those five uh, sites. 
So the important thing is to get a first drop tap sample, which based on the lead and copper rule, it is a sample collected from a, a consumption pipe, so tap or drinking fountain. And the water has to be sitting in that pipe for at least six hours and collected without flushing. So first thing in the morning prior to the use of that uh, location. For lead paint sampling and screening, there's multiple different ways to sample or screen. White sample or air samples can be used to collect uh, to analyze for lead in the air for dust. Uh, paint chip samples uh, is the EPA's lead renovation, repair, and painting rule, which is part of TOSCA, covers the way to do that. And it is important to collect multiple levels, uh, layers of paint, so it can get tricky to know how many layers and to have a complete sample because it could be one of the bottom layers that is lead paint, and it was painted multiple times over. And the samples have to be sent to an EPS, uh, EPA's National Lead Laboratory Accreditation Program lab. So on the EPA's website, you can find where, which labs fall into that in your state. And that is the most accurate way to determine whether there's lead paint present, a laboratory sample. However, a good accuracy, immediate result, low cost screening is using an XRF uh, analyzer, which can collect multiple screening points uh, on different types of sam uh, sample material and will give you real life um, live results. So you can get an idea whether lead is present in uh, the paint at your facility. So as I mentioned, in 1986, the State Drinking Water Act was passed. It banned the use of not lead-free plumbing fittings or fixtures or any solder or flux. And in 1991, the uh, lead and copper rule was passed, and it provided a concentration, uh, an action level for lead and copper and water. So if lead concentration exceeds the action level of 15 parts per billion, uh, or for copper, 1.3 parts per billion, in more than 10% of the consumer cap samples, the system must undertake a number of additional actions to control the corrosion. And if the action level for lead is exceeded, the system must also inform the public about steps that they should take to prevent, to protect their health, and they may have to replace the lead service line. For lead paint, the TASCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, established standards to help protect owners, lead paint professional or government agencies identify lead hazards. And a lot of them are also for residential properties, but also they focus on properties that are child facilities. Uh, the, in addition, OSHA has provided a, um, a permissible exposure limit of 50 micrograms per cubic meter of lead in air for in a workplace. And NIOSH recommended exposure level for lead is 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air as a time-weighted average. The EPA's lead renovation repair paint, uh, and painting rule, um, it provides regulations for firms provi uh, performing renovations, repairs, painting projects that disturb lead-based paint in homes, child care facilities, kindergartens, before 1978. So they must be EPA or state certified and must use certified renovators to follow specific work practices to prevent lead contamination. It is important that 
you have sort of certified and um, knowledgeable people because you don't want lead to enter the air and be a potential health hazard. The EPA defines lead-based paint as paint with lead levels greater than one, one microgram per uh, centimeter square, or more than 0.5% by weight. So once lead is identified, what do you do? So there's ways to reduce um, lead in drinking water, and you can flush the pipe prior to drinking, use cold water for eating and drinking, install water filters systems, remove the, the pipes that contain lead, um, and redu reduce the corrosiveness of the water. It is important to shut down the system and label the outlets or the taps that cannot be used or should not be used so the public knows. In addition, for lead and paint, you can inspect that all of the painted surfaces are not chipping so that would reduce the amount of lead dust in your area. Also, if you have any water damage at the facility, it should be addressed quickly and completely to prevent any chipping of paint and to keep the area uh, dust free. Additionally, you can get lead paint abatement, so either remove the lead paint or encapsulate it. And it's important to remove the waste that's generated accordingly to state regulations. So a case study, there's two different ones. They, one for the water, uh, it was at a Boston University, and samples were collected from eight different buildings, from two different drinking water fountains, so a total of 16 samples. And the samples were analyzed at a certified lab. The samples were compared to the Massachusetts maximum contaminate, contaminant level for lead, which was equal to the action level of 0 0.015 milligrams per liter. And out of all the 16 samples, only one was uh, detected above that level. So the fountain was shut down for, to prevent use, and the university plans to replace the unit with a filter-equipped water fountain in the future. And for the lead paint, it was also at a university setting, and we, uh, Trambert was assessing a property for potential environmental liability. And an inspection of and screening of painted surfaces was conducted. Testing of lead paint was performed using an XRF uh, analyzer. Uh, so it included painted surfaces on the interior and exterior of the building, and lead paint was identified in multiple rooms that were screened. So it was found in brick walls, door frames, casings, cement walls, railings, window casings, and painted pipes. So in multiple areas throughout the buildings it was found. So that was, we trying to provide a report with areas that were contaminated to the client. So the next section I will focus on is PCB, or polychlorinated biphenyls. So we have another poll question, and it is, how concerned are you that you might have a PCB problem? Thanks, Maria. I uh, just teed up that poll question for everybody to respond to. Um, so you'll, you'll see the choices there, uh, anywhere from very concerned to uh, not so concerned and Maria will talk more about PCBs in this section. Um, so we'll give everybody a few seconds to respond. All right, looks like that was just about everybody. Uh, we'll share the results, and it looks like um, the number one group is, is somewhat concerned at 45%, 40% not as concerned, and 15% of our audience today is very concerned about PCBs. Which is understandable, and we will focus on why you should be concerned or what air, what buildings should be concerned. So PCBs were um, used domestically between 1929 and 1979. The production decreased in the 60s, and by 1977, 
the number one producer, Monsanto, in the United States discontinued manufacturer. But it wasn't until 1979 when PCBs were banned in the United States. And PCBs were used because they have some great qualities or properties for manufacturing, which are chemically stable, they're non-flammable, high boiling point, they're tasteless and odorless, and they're good insulators. They are, for the most part, range from oily to waxy solids, thin light color to yellow waxy in color. And based on, since they're chemically stable, they remain present in the environment today. So they were used in multiple different uh, commercial uses, and they include electrical equipment, fluorescent light ballasts, transformers and capacitors, thermal insulation, adhesive tape, caulking plastic, so a lot of different material throughout buildings. So routes of exposure are through inhalation or dermal contact because PCBs are highly lipophytic. Lipophilic, they can be absorbed through skin following contact with contaminated equipment, water, or soil. And a lot of people are exposed to PCBs during repairs of construction when material that is containing or contaminated with PCBs is released into the air. Some health effects, the PCBs are known to uh, affect the immune system, the reproductive system, neurological system, endocrine system. So they have a multi-level uh, of uh, health issues. So the best way to find out whether you have PCBs or not is not to just look at your facility, is to um, collect samples and air samples building material samples and white samples are depicted on the slide to uh, determine whether you have PCBs. Air samples uh, are collected in a facility. They can be collected during construction work. And um, OSHA permissible PEL in a time-weighted average air balloon concentration of 1.0 milligrams per cubic meter for PCBs containing 42% chlorine. And for PCBs containing 54% chlorine, it's 0.5 milligrams per cubic meter. And building materials sample, it's collected straight from the building, and it just focus on different uh, materials. So mortar or brick is important, caulking material. And white sample on the uh, right side, it's collected on substances that m might have PCBs, so painted surfaces or um, any flat surface that you can get a white sample. So there's not a lot of laws and regulations on PCBs. Um, the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976 provides EPA with the authority to require reporting, record keeping, or testing requirements. When caught with PCB, concentration equal to or greater than 50 parts per million is removed, um, it all must be disposed of in accordance with the method provided in 40 CFR 761.62. Um, and there was a reinterpretation of what is PCB bulk waste, for example, PCB containing caulk or paint versus PCB remediation waste. For example, PCB containing masonry or concrete. The distinction is important to determine the appropriate cleanup requirements or disposal options at your facility. So if PCBs are identified, now what? Um, you can remove light ballast containing PCBs uh, and removing material PCBs, encapsulating PCB containing material are just couple ways to reduce uh, potential PCBs in your building. Um, and PCB bulk waste must be disposed in one of two ways, whether it is in permitted solid waste landfill or via risk-based disposal approval process. 
So a case study, um, so Triumvirate assessed at Massachusetts University with assessing a building for presence of PCB containing building material. The building was constructed in 1915. Samples were collected with a clean sampling tool. They were collected from floor matrices on the track, floor finishes on a wood floor, caulk around windows, and paint in rooms. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, US EPA defines substance containing PCBs equal to or greater than 50 parts per million. And um, the sample results indicated that samples collected were under the regulatory limit, and therefore no action was requ uh, required. So we provided this to the university for their uh, report. And now Ryan is going to focus on mercury and plumbing. All right, thanks, Maria. Uh, let me just get my notes set up. Jump right in here. All right, mercury and plumbing. Um, this is something that is often overlooked when it comes to building um, renovations or construction, uh, but it's it's definitely something that that needs to be um, needs to be watched during the demolition of mainly mainly piping, but we'll get into that. Um, so what is mercury? It's a naturally occurring element that in its pure form is liquid that volatilizes regularly. Um, exposure to high levels can harm the brain, heart, kidneys, and lungs, and the immune system, and it is odorless and colorless. Um, the consumption of fish is actually the most significant source of ingestion-related mercury exposure in humans. Um, but exposure to mercury can occur from breathing in contaminated air with mercury vapor, uh, ingestion, or even dermal um, exposure because mercury is readily absorbed through direct contact with bare skin. Um, and even something like methylmercury or organomercury, um, it can go through skin that's insufficiently protected, uh, even gloves when, when touching that. It's pretty nasty stuff. So where can it be found? Um, it's in thermostats, barometers, manometers, light bulbs, thermostats, uh, naturally in coal. Um, you know, all of those materials are within buildings. So even if one might think that, oh, we don't have mercury anywhere, we haven't used it in any sort of experiment, uh, it can still be present in old thermometers, um, thermostats, and manometers. Um, and just the history of use of certain areas within buildings like boiler rooms, uh, mechanical spaces, old switches, uh, it ends up getting in areas where you wouldn't expect it. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Like I said, within your facility you can find um, thermometers, manometers, thermostats. Breaking these products or improper disposal throughout the history of the building can result um, in spills or contamination. Um, containerized mercury, if switches exist that haven't been broken, uh, they can be disposed of as universal waste. Um, once the device is broken and the mercury is no longer contained, it poses a hazard and therefore has to be disposed of as hazardous waste as mercury um, in, its, in its raw form. So, like I said, one of the areas that we find this a lot of times during construction renovation projects is in relic plumbing. Um, mercury or mercury devices, broken mercury devices, are oftentimes thrown into sinks. Um, it might not be so much now, but in the past, um, you might not know about it. That's why it's often overlooked. Um, but once it is found, if it hasn't been sought at before demolition or renovation occurs, Remediation is very costly and very time consuming. So once it enters the system, um, it stays in the system. It's very hard to get out. It's heavy. It gets into things like shown here, sink traps, and it just stays there emitting vapors um, and, and contaminating the plumbing and potentially contaminating the water within also. So mercury and plumbing, uh, it's, most, it's commonly found in sink traps because those are the low spots and it is heavy. Um, removing the trap will remove the source. 
Um, we can also utilize a camera snake to investigate further into the plumbing to see if we can see any of these mercury beads. Um, and mercury vapor readings are also a very effective way to determine if the plumbing is contaminated with mercury prior to demolition or renovation. So mercury vapor measurement, um, there's various methods used to detect and quantify mercury in air. Uh, the detection limits for each of these methods vary significantly, so it's important to know what the regulations are. And regulations are even written in, in different um, units. They have milligrams per cubic meter, micrograms per cubic meter, or nanograms per cubic meter. Uh, it's really important to pay attention to those when measuring for mercury. Um, these are some examples. Um, of some mercury Jerome meters, uh, kind of the most common meter used nowadays for detecting mercury vapor. Um, they're the easiest method because they give real-time results. And they can also use um, an XRF, a Lumex, or a Drager. Um, they're a little less common. You can also submit samples to a laboratory. Um, but these real-time results are the, the quickest and easiest way to determine if you have a potential problem. Mercury vapor measurement, um, just showing here how the detection limits can vary. Uh, Drager tubes, 0.5 milligrams per cubic meter, while the Jerome goes all the way down to 0 0.00005 milligrams per cubic meter, um, similar to the Lumex um, and then the XRF. So Triumvirate utilizes the J505 for most mercury vapor monitoring activities. Um, it has the lowest, one of the lowest detection limits um, is readily usable and has few interferences, which I'm going to touch on right now. Um, potential interferences for the old Jerome, the 431X, uh, have been identified and they're listed in the owner's manual. They include things like hydrocarbons, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide at high levels, even water vapor and condensation, chlorine and ammonia. You see all these um, components are very common to laboratory piping or building piping. Um, so that's why they upgraded to the J505 or Lumex meters, which have no known interferences. Um, that's why Triumvirate utilizes that. And we can readily determine if we have an issue. OSHA established a PEL as a ceiling value of 0.1. That's the only legal enforceable federal U.S. standard for mercury vapor. But then NIOSH came in and essentially cut that in half with a REL, a recommended exposure level of 0 0.05 for 10-hour time-weighted average. And then the ACGIH cut that even lower to a threshold limit value of 0 0.025 milligrams per cubic meter. Um, the ATSDR recommends risk managers isolate humans from mercury spills when a concentration of greater than or equal 0 0.01 milligrams per cubic meter. So there's there's a lot of um, studies on this. OSHA is the only legal enforceable, but the studies of recommendation uh, are, they've been established and that we recommend that after a spill um, or potential exposure that we do it at the highest standard. So that's, this just kind of summarizes what the AS, ATSDR limits are um, for residential reoccupancy. You have um, the concentration less than 0 0.001 milligrams per cubic meter of mercury vapor, whereas acceptable personal effects level, if something were to spill on, in somebody's shoes or clothes, um, you want to get those levels below 0 0.01. Um, Residential isolation to keep people isolated from an area is 0 0.01. And the reoccupancy after a spill, um, this is a setting where mercury is not normally used, is 0 0.003. And the occupational setting where mercury is handled, they recommend 0 0.025. So you can see that the levels are very low. Um, and th that's the goal to get it down to if you do have a spill. And those levels can also be used to, to direct how you would treat something contaminated, mercury plumbing, such as a, a sink trap or a straight pipe that might be exhibiting concentrations similar to these would be something that you really want to just get out and dispose of as mercury contaminated waste. 
so you're not risking exposure to your plumbers or to occupants. So with that, worker health and safety, um, spills within a facility can pose a threat to a worker health and safety. Uh, and improper cleanup and use of improper PPE can lead to cross-contamination, hot spots, and improper waste disposal that will just increase cost and increase the potential for um, hazard for your employees or workers. So cleanup products and equipment, um, there's multiple things. If there is a spill, um, we use mercury vacuums are the most effective way to get elemental mercury as well as some treatment, cal some treatment chemicals such as mercury amalgamation or mercury vapor absorption. And waste disposal, uh, you can get rid of contaminated plumbing um, through mercury retort. The, the waste is put through a controlled high vacuum retort system that recycles the mercury and it can be recycled up to a very high purity. Um, and things like mercury switches, semiconductors, fluorescent light, that's from Naga manufacturers. That's, they all use this recycled, uh, recycled mercury. So case study, mercury and lab piping. Um, we identified a laboratory that utilized mercury routinely. Uh, a lot of it ended up in sink traps, contaminated piping. Uh, we removed it to each sink trap, collected the contents, and screened the straight piping with the Jerome meter. Traps with detections were removed and containerized and disposed of correctly. Uh, this was all done under the appropriate PPE and trained personnel. Um, remaining waste pipe was screened and any pipe with detections was cut and containerized. And all piping was removed until there was no detections on the Jerome and it was, re it was cleared for reoccupancy. So that's just a quick run through of mercury and piping. Um, some Summary facts to, to keep in mind that it's important to know what materials are present prior to construction or renovations to handle the building material and waste accordingly. Pipes in your building may contain lead, mercury, asbestos, wrap. It's, it's a high level of, uh, of contamination potential in, in old plumbing. It's important to assess a, a variety of building material to determine if they are hazardous. And planning ahead will save you time and money during your renovation and construction projects. So with that, I'll turn it over to James. Um, he's going to relay us some questions that you might have. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you both for a very informative presentation. Uh, and as Ryan said, we've, we've got some time here for questions. I've seen a few come in already, and we'll get to as many as we can with the time allowed. Um, you'll find Ryan and Maria's email address on this slide. Feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions um, once you absorb all this information today. Um, also a phone number there for Triumvirate. And I'm also going to shoot out a quick link um, to a complimentary hazardous building materials consultation, um, just in case you're interested in speaking one-on-one -on -one with, with an expert like Ryan or Maria uh, to talk about your construction renovation project and any potential hazards that might lie in the way. Um, so that's that's sent over. Take a look at that if you're interested. And now we'll get to those questions. So send them in. Um, and in the event we don't get to them all, we will follow up with you in the next couple of days. Uh, to start, we've got a question from Harold, and this is for you, Ryan. Are there any guidelines right. one? Can, yeah. Are there any guidelines one can use with building materials to know whether or not it contains asbestos? Uh, his example is floor tiles made after X year will not contain asbestos or fireproofing materials made after X year will not contain asbestos. What do you recommend there? Um, I, do, I do recommend that if it's suspect it gets sampled. However, it's, uh, it's likely that they don't contain asbestos if they're built or constructed after 1989. But that's only if you can get the data sheet on that material saying that it does not contain asbestos. So anything that's suspect is either assumed or, or sampled to prove that it is or is not asbestos. If you can get um, either an architect or a manufacturer of that particular product 
to say that no asbestos containing material was involved in this process, then then you, you can use that. But if you can't produce that sort of data, then you have to either assume or sample. Got it. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Maria, this one's for you. It's on, on PCBs. Jason wants to know, you know, can you talk briefly about the pros and cons of not sampling PCB materials and assuming that they are greater than 50 parts per million for disposal? So um, you don't know what the concentration is. So if you have a suspect material that um, and your building uh, falls into the years prior to 1979, then it's more advantageous to sample because they will know whether you have PCBs, and then you can uh, focus on minimizing the exposure by either encapsulating them or renovating the snow space to remove it. However, um, there's different types of samples if you want to, if it's a cost issue that you can deal with, whether it's an air sample or a product sample. But for the most part, if you think your building might have PCBs, it's always safer to sample. Great. Thanks, Maria, for clarifying that. And Ryan, let's, let's take it back to you. This is a mercury question uh, from Catherine. What kind of device or sampling method do you recommend for sampling mercury in suspected contaminated soil? Soil, you can use one of two things. The XRF, the X-ray um, fluorescent analyzer, is actually built to detect metals in soil. Uh, it has the ability to penetrate a certain amount of that soil also to see if that uh, mercury is existent in the soil. I think that would be my, my number one recommendation is the XRF um, just set to detect for mercury. You can also use the Jerome, which will detect for mercury vapor. But if the mercury contamination is um, any deeper than surface, then that wouldn't be as effective as that XRF. Excellent. Uh, Catherine, I hope, I hope that helps and that answers your question. Um, Christine asks, does AHERA, A-H-E-R-A, apply to more than just schools? Um, no, but <laughs> yeah. it doesn't on a federal level, but it does. Um, Massachusetts, for example, says if you're if your building um, produces an asbestos management plan, it has to follow the AHERA guidelines. Um, so that's kind of on a state level, but other than that, uh, AHERA is mainly geared is geared towards K through 12 schools. Got it. And we've got one minute left and two more questions, so I think we can get through these. Mary asks, is there a built after date that you would not need to perform the inspections? 1989, if the architect or engineer certifies that no asbestos-containing materials were utilized. That's very specific. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Um, and let's finish with this. Raymond has a couple questions in here. Um, we'll, we'll take his first one. How would you measure remnant fireproofing if found between horizontal beam and roof deck? There's an example um, here. The, that yeah, I mean, he says uh, if horizontal beam run is, is 10 feet, would you say that there is 10 linear feet of ACM? Oh, you'd have to look at the you'd have to look at the beam. So if it's yeah. if the if it's an I beam and it's on all sides, then you have to do a little bit of math and you have to take the flat surfaces um, and you know multiply it out for each surface that's covered in material, and then that's your total. So it's if it's completely linear, then it's easy. But if, it, if it's an I-beam or something and all the surfaces are coated, then it takes into account uh, all, all the surfaces that have the material on them. All right. Thank, thanks for the question, Ray. Um, I know you had a follow-up there, so why don't you, I, I'd recommend maybe shooting Ryan a message. 
um, and maybe he can he can help you out further. But we are unfortunately all out of time. I want to thank Ryan and Maria both for presenting today. I hope everyone found some value in, in what we've discussed here with, with these building uh, hazards. Please reach out if you have any further questions. We'd love to continue the conversation. And again, keep an eye out for an email tomorrow. It'll include today's presentation, a recording of the webinar, and a survey to let us know what you thought. Um, that's all we've got. Thank you very much. Guys, any, any final words? No, thank you all for attending. Um, and feel free to shoot me an email if you have any specific questions. Excellent. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Take care.